Talk about Oh my gosh, it's the right size. <laughs> yeah, I um I don't know what to do except sing it. Memories and music don't mix too well. Jukebox records don't play those wedding bells. Looking at the world through the bottom of a glass, all I see is a man who's fading fast. Tonight I'll meet that woman again. What I'd give for my baby to just walk in Sit down beside me, say it's all right Take me home, make sweet love to me tonight So here I am again Mixing misery and gin Set with all my friends And talking to myself I might look like I'm having a good time But every fool can tell That this honky-tonk heaven Really makes me feel I light a lonely woman's cigarette We start talking about things we want to forget Her life story and mine are the same We both lost someone and we both had ourselves to blame Set with all my friends and talking to myself I might look like I'm having a good time But any fool can tell That this honky-tonk heaven really makes me feel A song or what? That is a song. Yeah, yeah. And you sang it. Oh, well, thank you. I, you know, I, I, it, I was never, you know, every country singer uh, that came along sounded like Merle. You know, everybody wanted to sound like Merle. I couldn't sound like Merle. You know, I'm down here. You know, I tried to imitate Johnny Cash and Ernest Tubb. You know? <laughs> but the songs, um, when we backed up, we were. So fortunate that we did the tour, the Last of the Breed tour. We called it the Last of the Weed tour. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Willie Merle and Ray Price, and uh, and we backed them all of them up, except Ray because he had his orchestra. And uh, but they'd come out and sing, and it, it's uh, we, uh, we did a TV show, and uh, it's the, and Freddie Powers was still uh, able to sing a little bit and was on it, and and yeah, Freddie was one of Merle's best pals and great songwriters, but. Um, it was the highlight of our musical life. I mean, to, to be able to do that for, you know, play Nightlife with Willie, Merle, and Ray to play all the great hag songs that uh, we did, you know. And, and when we started the band, Leroy, this is a great story, Leroy had a, his mom had passed away and he got a tattoo of a, a horseshoe with a black rose and it said, Mama Tried. We lived in Paw Paw, West Virginia, and one of the local fellas there, old Oozle Moreland, uh, Oozle's a good country name, and, I remember Uzzle looked at uh, Leroy's arm and he went, Mama's tired. <laughs> <laughs> first, case, first case of dyslexia in Pawpaw. <laughs>
But, uh, <laughs> Great story. Man. Yeah, I, I, I love the man, and uh, uh, we were here in Nashville for um, some ill-fated show the uh, not not long ago, and got to sit and, and talk with Merle uh, for about an hour, and that was the thing. The depth of knowledge that the, that man had of music was. Uh, we would talk about Milton Brown and this is old stuff. And he was he was all inclusive. He had it all there. He was the history of country music in one man, and that was amazing. Thank you for having me here, Bill. Great to have you, Ray. Ray Benson. This is how they do it. This is how you do it in the golf tournament. All of us in this room hear people say all the time that they wish they could hear more traditional type country music there's a guy in this room that uh, that bless his heart uh, he and uh, Willie because it's called Willie's Roadhouse on Sirius XM radio it's one place you can go to and hear traditional country music you can hear the old country music you can hear the classics the new stuff a lot of our uh, viewers might have heard this man's voice but never seen his face but we are so glad to have you here with our friend Dallas Wayne from down in Austin, Texas. Dallas, thank you for coming up here to be with us. What a pleasure to be here, Bill. Uh, as, as you can see, if you haven't seen my face before, he has one for radio, as the saying goes. <laughs> but it's an honor to be here. I can't think of a, a more perfect way to pay tribute to Merle. How many interviews you reckon you did with Merle over his lifetime? I was trying to think of that the other day, and I think about six or seven, and they would get longer as he got older. Uh, I think, and I've been, been given a lot of thought about Merle, I think he was more comfortable in his skin in the last four or five years of his life than I, I can ever recall. Why do you think that was? I think he just, he just, he, he may have had figured out the secret to everything. He may not have shared it with everybody, but that could have been it. And I think, I think he just was, was much more content in the last, in the last few years, it seemed like to me. I may be able to add a little possibility to it. I know uh, he sang me the last song he wrote that I know of for sure. I, there's no way there was another after it because he died within a couple weeks. He was working on it. I don't even know if Dad finished the song. But when me and my wife were up there in uh, Reading visiting with him, knowing good and well this was going to be the last time we seen him, I was just me in there in the hospital with him, and he, sang, he was singing me the last song he was writing, and it was entitled The Last Escape. Okay, and um, you know, Dad knew he was dying. There was no mystery to this. He knew he knew it was near, and um, to the point that he he called the day he was going to do it. And uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, Dad's always known Jesus. You know, I keep bringing up Jesus, by the way. But by the way, that's all that matters. And um, it is an eternal issue. And there's no doubt in my mind he he made peace with God through Jesus. Okay. And the closer he got to meeting him, and I, I, I'm getting older, and I'm getting closer to home too, and I can't imagine that not bringing me some peace. Yep. yep. You know, so I just think Jesus was the centerpiece of his peace. Hey, Bill, Dallas was very kind to let a bunch of us call in to tell a moral story or. Whatever, I thank you for that, man. It meant a lot oh, to me. It meant a whole lot it, to me. Everybody calling in and sharing the memories and sharing the stories, I think it helped everybody, all of us, get through it. Because it was it a... It was very cool. It was a, a rough 24, or well, 36 hours, I guess, by the time we got all done with it. But it was... Uh, well, was Dallas pulled the strings to get that interview that I did with Merle played again on XM that weekend. And Which I, was I one of the finest interviews much. I've ever heard. It was just Thank pure it was, magic. It was, as Eddie Stubbs would say, an anointed hour that, uh, <laughs> that I got to spend with him. What, what did you learn? Are six long interviews, and each one got a little... What, what did you learn about Merle that, that maybe the rest of us don't even know? I, I think... Well, one of the things I took away from... from him as an artist is I, I don't know for sure if he realized that he was one of the last the, the tour was called Last of the Breed that, that you guys were on and I think that's an appropriate name because I don't think there was anybody there are, there are very few of them left anyway that were one of the best 
singers you've ever heard, one of the greatest guitar players you've ever heard, one of the greatest songwriters you've ever heard. He did everything. The fiddle playing, it, it got pretty good. <laughs> uh, but he could do all those things so well, and I don't, I don't know that he ever realized how, how masterful he was at any of it. And he would, uh, he would sit there and he'd kind of size people up. And I think once he got comfortable with it, with it, that situation that he was in, he would open up. It was, sometimes it was kind of hard to follow his conversations. Well, we did a, a show together in Kansas City uh, about three years ago, I guess it was. And the conversation went somewhere else, and then he went back to something that was 30 minutes before, and he, and, but he had had a cozy he thought of it, and it just like, you had to keep up kind of a little bit between it all. Were most of your interviews with him done on the phone or was he there in person? Uh, the last two uh, that he that we did, uh, one of them when he was there in Austin at our studios, he was upstairs playing at ACL. And uh, he said, they said, uh, Merle's coming down. And I was still on the air. And we, we did that one then. And then the last one was on the phone when he was in the hospital. Uh, he he called in back uh, in December, I guess it was. What, wouldn't that be the right, Ben? Yep. And I think it was in December. And just to th just to thank his fans for thanking you know thinking of him and and uh, praying for him. And he wanted he wanted to thank uh, Mrs. Autry. I remember that, and because she was the one that made him go to the hospital, wasn't it? And I thought that was really nice. It was important to him to do that, and. Uh, that was the last one. Before you were a disc jockey, you were an entertainer. I mean, you still are. You work as an entertainer. The, the, the base, it, it, that's open for a debate, but thank <laughs> you. You did a great job on the opera the other night. Oh, thank you, you did very a really much. good job. How about singing a Merle Haggard song for us? Be honored to, you right. bet. Dallas Wayne. If I can get up out of this chair. <laughs> I'll take this with me, apparently. <laughs> Dallas, you come on the air every day about, it's like noon Eastern time, right? Yes. <laughs> Willie's Roadhouse, channel... Channel 59. <laughs> on Sirius XM, and I know all of us sure listen to you and appreciate what you do. You know, Dallas Wayne was, he's like the Merle Haggard of Finland. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't tell a lot of people that, but yeah. Well, explain Garth Brooks, what you mean. Well, he was a huge star, like a Garth Brooks, would you say, or a Merle Haggard, he was all of those, of Finland. What do you mean, was? He made, well, I, he's, he moved back here. Oh, oh, you mean he lived, you lived over there? I lived over there for four years. Oh, yeah. right. Didn't they just recarpet that country? They, they certainly <laughs> did, yeah. Rhode Island could be the crap out of it in a war. <laughs> one of the things about Merle, he not only was one of the greatest songwriters, obviously, that ever lived, but he also had one of the best ears for other people's material that, uh, he could spot a great song, and this is one written by Sonny Throckmorton. Wish I would die in some blue by bamboo cane. Stuck in the sand, but the road I'm on, it don't seem to go there. I'll just dream and keep on being the way I am. Wish I enjoyed what makes my living, what I do. Some might run, but that ain't like me. I'll just dream and keep on being the way I am. Barber dancing, I'll just dream and keep on being the 
Job, Dallas. I had no idea that your dad didn't write that song. Now, that just sounds like a page out of his autobiography or something. It's amazing. Well, he, he obviously, you know, he, Hank Cochran or Red, uh, Sonny Throckmorton, Dave Kirby, he, he, you know what, he, he knew when he heard a song he should have wrote. Okay? And that's what he did. He found songs that I should have wrote that. They, they fit him just like he did. And he, he was the best at picking songs. But the what absolute. a small percentage of what he recorded. Very small, he probably ten percent, maybe fifteen, yeah. maybe, maybe. Dad was he 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 had, he had some good ears on him. Gosh, okay, he little bitty ones, but real good ones. <laughs> <laughs> Ron Devinson, are you gonna sing "Mama's Tired"? Mama's tired, yeah, I will. <laughs> Mama's getting tired, yeah. That's my song, I got a five month old. <laughs> yeah, that's Sonia's theme song right now with her baby. <laughs> oh, that's right, yeah. Uh, I would love to. Talk about, uh, about your relationship with Merle. Did you, did you tour with him any? It's already been talked about that he was a big bluegrass fan and you do a lot of bluegrass. Well, one of my, my greatest honors, I think, of my, my lifetime was getting to sing on uh, Merle, and uh, George Jones did a, an all duet project. I think the second one that they did. And I got to sing on five songs on that album. And I knew after that, I said, you know what? That's about as good as it gets when you sing with Merle and George at the same time. So wow. that was a great honor. About uh, a year ago, I guess, um, we were in Florida and we were performing and we had a night off. And it was actually January 28th of 2015. I will not forget this day. And uh, we had the day off, and I started, uh, got online and was looking, and it's like, oh my goodness, Merle Haggard is at The Villages, Florida. And we were probably four or five hours southbound by Fort Myers. And so I look, got online, it was sold out. And so what do you do when the show is sold out? And I remembered that his driver, Ray McDonald, had came to our show about five years ago. And so it's, uh, I'm about to go to sleep, but I said, oh, I've got his number. I text Ray. I said, hey, Ray, the show's sold out. We would love to come see Merle, and we would even open the show. <laughs> and do you know, about 10 o'clock the next morning, I got a text, and he said, the chief said, come on down. And we got to not only meet him, I never forget the, just the hospitality. I mean, Teresa came over, and I got to, we got to sit and talk. In fact, Ben, maybe you guys can help me. He said he had written a song that I could do, so if you can... But he didn't send that, so I can't remember can, what it was. You don't know? Oh no! So I hope to get I that song. I didn't get to work that night because you came in. Okay. <laughs> hey, you stole five hundred dollars uh, from him. No, but, uh, geez. <laughs> but I wouldn't trade that I'd for us. I'd much rather hear you than me. So. Oh, that was so fun. Anyway, we got to open for him that night, and he even played Hunter's fiddle. And so, the evening of his passing. Hunter got that fiddle, and he's been playing that fiddle ever since because of your dad. So um, very special occasion for us, and, and loved his music. I mean, um, we'll be driving down the road. We have what you call theme nights. It might be Conway, um, and they'll have Merle night. And so what they'll do is pick up the lyrics on the phone if they don't know the songs, and I'll take turns singing Merle songs. And, and uh, so we loved him and loved doing his songs, and just uh, recorded this song. So very exciting to get to sing it today. Recorded it for? Uh... In, we recorded it in a, a bluegrass version of Mama Tried. Wow. 
So, yeah. It just, in fact, released, I think, today. So. Well, lay it on us. I would be happy to. Rob DeVinci. That is one of the most identifiable guitar licks in the history of country music that Jimmy Capps just played. Ben, since you played good, who played that on, on Merle's original record? Roy Nichols, I believe. Roy played it? Yeah, right. James Burton. No. James Burton. James, James Burton. Burton, was it? Can I tell you a story about that lead? Do it. You yeah. want to hear it? Yeah. James was notorious about overdubbing, because if you'll listen to the record real close, you know, it, it has that, uh, the beginning of it said a high-end telly, and then goes to almost to a a low end strat sound almost. What it was was James taped the first section of that solo on a telecaster with brand new strings on it with the high end pickup. And then when it goes to that bumpa doopa dumpa doopa dumpa, they edited it right there. And he went and got him a guitar and had dead strings put on it and put it on the low end bumpa doopa. Because if you listen, you can't hear the flip of the toggle switch. Okay, there's two different guitars on that thing. He did that so nobody could do it live like he did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. James Burton. Notorious for that. I live in Louisiana. He, we go to the same church. Yeah. James ain't right. Okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all go to the same church. You ain't right. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Only in Jesus am I right. <laughs> Vince, talk about the song that you have written about Merle, and you brought a. Fabulous musician with you to play it. Yeah, Paul Franklin and I um, had the great honor and privilege of, of honoring Merle and Buck and the, the whole Bakersfield sound with a record a couple of years ago called Bakersfield. And that record was meant, I think, from our hearts, more to honor the musicians. Uh, that record felt like more of a guitar record out of me than a singing record out of me. And it got to, to honor the great Telecaster players and... Also, one song we played Strat on to honor Reggie and, and all those great guitar players. I think what uh, has been one of the most moving things for me to witness in the last few years is for Merle to have had Ben uh, come along and be able to play all those licks that all those great guitar players played. And uh, that had to be the greatest gift of all. And yeah. you're a bad boy. <laughs> Of 
Could we get you and Paul? Yeah, I'd absolutely. Love to, uh, yeah, to do that. Mike Johnson, great steel guitar player in our family reunion band. You said you had some words you wanted to say about Paul Franklin. Oh, no. I gave him $100. <laughs> you owe me 50 Paul, by the way. I get, yeah, can you guys hear me? Here we go. The, um, a lot of things, uh, Pate, uh, Paul is just a, he's a master of the instrument and a great player. A lot of people don't know that he was part of the, uh, the crew and a big part of it that brought country music, great country music back in the late 80s and the, and the early 90s. Uh, he played on Keith Whitley and, and uh, Alan Jackson and all the stuff that was ran. And, and, uh, I'm sorry? And Rodney Crowell, that's right. That was a big, a big moment there. And, uh, and then not only that, but I mean, he's just this great country music player, but he also played with the, the greatest rock and roll band of all times, Dire Straits. So he, he is like one of the, I mean, he's just an incredible. And uh, I just want to say how much I love him. He's a, he's a jewel, buddy. It's good. Thank you so much. But, Paul, uh, we knew it when you were, what, 12 years old? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, Bill had a pants. television show in, in Canada, and uh, you invited me. I was just, Sonny Garris, your steel player, saw me play, and you invited me to do that show, and I was still nervous. <laughs> I'm still nervous. I've got that. a beautiful picture of, of little Paul with his uh, cowboy hat on sitting behind a, a little uh, bandstand type thing that said Bill Anderson on the front of it, and you, you were... Uh, every bit of about 12 years old, and you could pick then, and you ain't stopped, and you're, you're terrific. Vinny, you ain't bad either. Well, <laughs> best you could get on a Tuesday yeah. for free. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I met Paul, gosh, 35 years ago, and uh, thanks, Paul. And uh, he, I think he was playing with Tillis at the time. And if I'd known what I know about Tillis and his boys, I'd have never got on that bus. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we just hit it off all those years ago. And I was like, you know, I go back and I see interviews of me in the 70s and playing with the bluegrass bands or playing with Pure Prairie League, whatever I've done. And, and any time they talk to me about what it was that you wanted to do, I said, I want to be like Merle Haggard. You know, from day one, it never, I knew exactly what I wanted to do and what I wanted to do it like. Um, I was talking to Dallas, we did a really neat um, uh, interview uh, that day, uh, and I called in and talked to him for a pretty good while, and, and we both were sitting there going, what, what was it? What was, the, what, was the, what was the thing that just set him above and, and apart from everybody else. And to me, I think it might have been the fact that he did go to prison in that we as, as a country, we as a people, we are so proud of our freedom. That's what we hold dearest, yeah. you know, and maybe the most precious that we, we hold is that freedom. And him as an 18, 19 year old kid, whatever it was, had his taken away. And I, I think it gave him a, a perspective in life of how to write songs and how to tell stories that they never, they never seem to not have hope in them. That was the best part of all, you know? Even Mama tried, you know? As, as, as dark as it sounds, it's still got hope in it. And one gets to him right, but Mama tried, you know? And I just, um, I was so taken um, by his ability to, to tell the truth. You know, I think he was the greatest truth teller I ever heard in my whole life. Um, I'll never forget the first time I got to meet him. Um, I, was, uh, I was playing with Pure Prairie League at the time, and um, we were opening for Emmy Lou. And Emmy was one of my great heroes and great friends. And, and uh, Emmy and I had sung at Red Rocks together that night. And I found out that Merle was playing um, all honky-tonks. He was doing a tour of just honky-tonks and beer joints. And I found out about it, and I told Emmy, I said, hey, Merle's playing about 45 minutes from here at, at, a, at some old honky-tonk, you know. She said, my God, let's go, you know. So we fired up a couple of cars full of people, and, and the first time I got to hear Merle Haggard sing live was in a really funky old beer joint, and it was the greatest experience I ever, I ever heard. To hear those songs, you know, that's what he used to talk about. He said... Songs either come from the church house or the beer joint, you know, and, and his 
or the greatest of all. But I, um, I remember uh, Eddie Stubbs and I had made a pact to, to call Merle on his birthday and woke up to the news that he'd passed. And uh, anyway, I just immediately started um, finding my heart to see what I see what I wanted to say about Merle. It's, I felt a little bit presumptuous doing a, a, a song of my own today, and, and, a, and here's a man that, that that wrote the greatest songs I've ever heard. And, and uh, but at, at the at the real truth of this is he wrote this song. I was on the road in Georgia And I heard Merle had passed away Hell, I thought he'd live forever He shaped every note I played Tonight these old white lines look different than they usually do It was my greatest inspiration Reason why I sang the blues Taught me how to play the guitar And write a country song Spent some time in San Quentin For the things that he'd done wrong He made me proud to be an Okie God knows we paid our dues It was my greatest inspiration And why I sing the blues I'm lost In a world Without haggard It's a world I thought I would never see Country music. He's the best it's ever been. An honest voice of reason, like we won't see again. If I could hear one last song. Merle that I would choose it was my greatest
greatest inspiration The reason why I sing the blues I'm lost In a world Without haggard Follow that except to say, let's take a break. We'll be back. <laughs> 